to the pyramid that we looked at earlier. You can react, you can anticipate, you can design, you can transform. Uh, there's something very nice that I read in Peter Senge's book, uh, The Fifth Discipline. And he's talking about, you know, if you are the captain of a large ship, an ocean liner, let's say, right, captain, or you're the leader. So how would you think of your task of leadership? Okay. It's one thing to say, okay, I've got a ship. I need to make sure that it's heading in the right direction. Things are happening properly. Okay. So one way to look at it is to say, well, this is the system that I have. And I want to make sure that it's guided properly. Another approach is to think of the role of a leader not from the point of view of operating an existing system, but from the point of view of influencing the design of the system so that the system is fit to operate. Okay, That's a different way to look at leadership. So when you're a leader of an organization, right, you, it's one thing to think about, okay, here's the organization and I need to chart a right course for this organization. Okay, I'm given this organization. I need to look at, you know, uh, making sure the organization performs well. Another way to look at the task of the leader is to say, let me change the fundamental design of the organization so that I have an organization that is strong enough to operate, that is well designed so that it can be really solid and it can perform. Okay, so it's one thing to look at the leader as the one who is guiding the organization. It is another to look at a leader who is building up an organization. By building, we mean creating the right kind of organization, designing the right sort of organization so that that very design is so good that it makes the organization succeed. Okay, so there are different levels at which you can look at organizations. But in this diagram, what I'm really trying to say is most of the time you find that people are reacting okay that is why i've got the water line shown at at that level right you see the water line here that is what is the visible part of what is going on in the world most of the rest of the stuff going deeper is all underneath it's it's sort of the hidden part of the iceberg which people never see okay in fact even when you see an example of a very successful leader, you know, somebody who is really successful, what we can observe of that person's behavior and success is simply that person's reaction to events. That's all we see. Okay. Most of the time, the all the other good work that they did is hidden beneath the surface. It's not easy to spot all of that. It's only through careful analysis that we'll see that they succeeded not because of how they reacted to events, but because of all these other things that they did. Okay, so we try to look at systems from a so-called feedback view. We've got goals and we've got the environment as it turned out. And based on the discrepancy between the goals and the environment as it is, we make decisions, hopefully, to change the environment to what we want it to be. Okay. So decisions alter the environment, leading to new decisions. But of course, all of these decisions have our intended impacts on the environment, but they also have what we call as side effects. Of course, they're side effects simply because we didn't anticipate them. And the side effects also have their own impacts on the environment. right? And some of these side effects are actions of other people, right? other participants in that situation, other agents, and of course those agents have their own goals and their actions also have an impact on the environment, often counterbalancing the impact that we had on the environment. Right? So obviously if you want to manage a situation, you have to understand the situation in its entirety and only then will you be able to make the right kinds of decisions. Okay. So an example is the so-called zero emission vehicle, which is a car that's 100% electric. It has no emissions by itself. Right? So zero emission vehicles, um, we see them being touted all the time. 
But this is not really solving the problem, is it? Because the zero emission vehicle uses electric equipment, somebody has to manufacture that electric equipment. And somebody has to, you have to, you need the infrastructure to generate electricity to charge the batteries for a zero emission vehicle. And the electricity that is generated might be generated using conventional techniques, you know, coal burning or oil burning uh, electric technology, uh, generation technology, which of course causes emissions, right? So a zero emission vehicle is not really a zero emission vehicle. It's what might be called as a displaced emission vehicle. You've changed the emission from the car emitting to the emissions being done somewhere else. Okay. An important concept in taking a systems view of things is to understand what are called feedback loops. Right. So we can already see that by our approach, by endogenous explanations, we are realizing that we are not taking an open loop view of systems, you know, XP. It's one directional. It's seldom the case that influences are one directional. Influences are almost always cycles. They are feedback cycles. Right. So systems are composed of what are called as feedback loops. And we need to understand all the feedback loops in order to be able to explain how systems will behave. So let's take a simple toy kind of an example. Okay. So you've got, uh, this is an example of the kind of diagram we're looking at to do systems thinking. So it's actually a serious diagram, even though the, uh, the situation seems to be sonic. So you've got chickens. And of course, the more chickens you have, the more eggs they're going to lay. Okay. So that is why you see that there's a plus on the arrow that connects chickens to eggs. So think of all of these as variables, eggs, chickens, road crossings, they're all variables which can have a numeric value. Okay. It can be measured in the form of a number. You can have 100 chickens, 1000 chickens. They're going to lay whatever, 50 eggs, 100 eggs. And so many chickens may indulge in so many road crossings, which are all numbers. So these are all variables that can take on different values over time. Okay. So today we have 100 chickens. Tomorrow we may have 120. Day after tomorrow we have 150 uh, chickens and so on. Right. So all in, in systems thinking, what we are interested in is variables and how those variables change over time. Okay. Uh, so in a causal loop diagram, you indicate how one variable has a causal influence on another variable. In other words, that variable, the value of one variable has a direct impact on the value of another variable. It causes another variable. Okay. Uh, so there is causation. We're not simply saying, well, uh, I've just observed that the number of chickens and the number of eggs are correlated statistically. No, here we are talking about causality. This causes that. I throw the ball, therefore, the ball goes uh, flying, flying up in the air. That ball didn't go up flying up in the air for no reason. I threw it and my throwing caused it to happen. Right? I studied hard. That caused my grades to improve. Okay. So it's not as if you saw that people are studying hard and you saw that the grades were high and you figured, well, there's some kind of invisible relationship between these two that it didn't cause this, but it's just a correlation. Okay. It's not a correlation. In these cases, it's a causation. Correlation is when you see two variables that just happen to be coincidentally changing uh, related. Okay. The, the, they seem to be uh, coincidentally related and they may not necessarily be caused by one another. Okay. So here in causal loop diagrams, we are really looking at causation and not just correlation. Okay. Uh, so uh, the more chickens you have, the more eggs you have. So the plus sign on the arrow indicates not that this causes this to increase. Not really that. What it says is the more of chickens you have, the more eggs you would have, 
had you know more than the prior level of chickens right so suppose you had 100 chickens if you have 110 chickens you're likely to have more eggs than if you had only 100 chickens okay so that's the idea here and the beauty is that the plus sign really indicates that these two variables tend to move in the same direction which means if i have 90 chickens instead of 100 chickens then i would have less eggs than i would have had if i had had 100 chickens okay so that's the idea here that these two variables move in the same direction okay so the more chickens you have the more eggs you have the more eggs you have of course the more chickens you're going to have when the eggs hatch and the less eggs you have the less number of chickens you're going to have than if you had had more eggs right so these two variables also move in the same direction so that is why that arrow also has a plus sign and of course we know that eggs cause chickens to happen if you have eggs the eggs are going to hatch and you're going to have more chickens so it's not a, just a coincidental relationship it's a direct causal relationship okay uh, so that's so here you see you've got a a loop because you start from chickens you trace the path and you come back to chickens that's a causal loop because every link is a causal link and this loop is what we call as a reinforcing loop think of it this is like compound interest the money the more mo you have money you earn interest you have more money you earn even more interest you have even more money and so what is going to happen is that the money is going to keep on increasing in an exponential fashion okay that's a reinforcing loop or a positive feedback loop on the other hand the more chickens you have the more of them are going to try and cross the road and thereby get killed right so the more chickens you have the more road crossings are going to happen the more road crossings happen some chickens get killed and the less chickens you have so these two variables move in opposite directions on the lower side on the upper side the two variables the upper arrow causes the two variables to move in the same direction the lower arrow causes them to move in opposite directions the more road crossings the less chickens i have okay so let's start with this increase the number of chickens get more ch road crossings that decreases the number of chickens right so an increase in this variable you tra trace through the loop ends up in a decrease in the variable that is called as a balancing loop because that is what keeps the chicken population under check okay this is a balancing loop and balancing loops are characterized by us having an odd number of minus signs right as i had already indicated minus sign indicates that these two variables are going to move in opposite directions so the more road crossings you have the less chickens you would have than if there were less road crossings right so let's say there are 100 road crossings you're going to have uh, you know some number of chicken if you have 200 road crossings you're going to have less chickens than you would have had if you had only 100 road crossings right so increase in this causes a decrease in this decrease in this would cause an increase in this what we mean by that is if you have lower road crossings you will have more chickens than you would have had otherwise okay so these two variables are moving in opposite directions and this is what is called as a balancing loop or a negative feedback loop okay so you start with an increase trace through the loop you you find that it ends up with a decrease positive feedback loops are loops in which you've got an even number of minus signs or no minus signs right because two minus signs can cancel out right something reduces something else reduces uh, you know a, as a result of that something else may increase because that's the other negative sign okay because remember in a negative sign the variables move in opposite directions okay so given this here is a system we call this a system because they are all interconnected here is a system in which you've got two feedback loops one is positive the other is negative right so what trend let's say if you have got what will be the way in which this variable number of chickens behaves you've got two feedback loops okay the way to look at that is if this loop were controlled if this whole system were controlled only by this loop 
by the positive feedback loop. In other words, if the positive feedback loop is stronger, then the whole behavior of the system will be controlled by that feedback loop and the population of chickens will continue to grow exponentially. Okay. On the other hand, if the negative feedback loop dominates, in other words, if the rate at which the road crossings occur is much greater than the rate at which eggs are laid, okay, so maybe uh, uh, then the chicken population is going to be less, okay, or more precisely, if the rate at which chickens die off as a result of road crossings is higher than the rate at which eggs are hatching to create new chickens, right, then the balancing loop will dominate and the chicken population will grind down to zero, right? Because no matter what you do, chicken are dying at a faster rate than they're being hatched. So the population is going to keep on decreasing till it reaches zero, right? So the dynamics of this system is controlled by whichever of the feedback loops is stronger. Miraculously, it could happen that the two feedback loops are equally strong and the population is maintained more or less stable. Right. So even in such a simple system, you have to think about it carefully to understand how the system is actually going to behave. Let's think about this scenario that is shown here. Right. So let's say your company makes a product and we could think in terms of how attractive is our product? What are the determinants? of the attractiveness of our product. Clearly, we can see that quality, price, delivery delay and product functionality are all things that have an impact on product attractiveness. Okay, so obviously the higher the quality, the more attractive your product is, the higher the price, the more attractive your product is, the higher the delivery delay, the less attractive your product is. And of course, the greater the functionality, the more attractive your product is. Of course, we could have lots of other variables influencing product attractiveness. Let's just focus on these variables for now. Now, very often, people tend to think of these linkages as unidirectional linkages. In other words, quality of each of these variables affects product attractiveness. But we don't think about really how product attractiveness also has an impact on each of these variables. Okay. In other words, what we're trying to say is that all of these linkages are bidirectional linkages, really speaking. Okay. But we tend to take what is called as an open loop view of systems. Okay. So as a result, we say, well, in order to make our product more attractive, we have to work on these variables. Right? Or alternately, uh, you may gather data over a long period of time and create a regression model that says, well, what is the equation that determines product attractiveness as a function, as a linear function in case of uh, linear regression, as a linear function of these variables. Right. So typical thinking, business thinking today would say, well, let's create a linear regression that defines product attractiveness as a result of, as a function of all of these variables, let us see which of these variables has the greatest impact on product attractiveness. So maybe uh, you do your survey, you do your analysis and you find that uh, price is the most important factor that determines product attractiveness. And then you start thinking, okay, uh, my better, my real approach to handling this situation is going to be to deal with price. Okay. So I think about how much can I reduce the price uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, that is the so-called open loop view of systems, right? Can you really think about how product attractiveness has an impact on quality, on price, on delivery delay and functionality? That's an interesting thing to look at. And it's very illustrative in the sense that this will tell us, show us really that all linkages that we see are feedback loops. There's almost no one directional influence in the systems that we deal with, which are of interest to us. Okay. So here you see right in the middle down here, we have our old diagram from the previous page, right? Which is 
quality, price, delivery delay, functionality, all influence product attractiveness. Of course, we know that quality has a positive impact. That is, in other words, uh, higher the quality, higher the attractiveness, so there's a plus. Higher the price, lower the attractiveness, so it's a minus. Higher the delivery delay, lower the attractiveness, that's a minus. Higher the functionality, higher the attractiveness, that's a plus. Okay? Or you can reason in the opposite way. Lower the quality, lower the attractiveness. So since both variables are moving in the same direction, it's a plus. These two variables move in opposite directions. Lower the price, higher the attractiveness, therefore minus, and so on. So that way we could explain the signs on each of these arrows. Okay. But now think about it. We are now, in, in systems thinking, we always take a dynamic view of a system. In other words, we talk about what is happening to the system over time. So it's not just a snapshot. We're not taking a look at a system as if it's frozen in a point at a point in time, because that's not true. All systems that we are dealing with are dynamic systems. They evolve over time. And unless you take into account what is happening to a system over time, you will not be able to manage the system properly. And that's a big problem with regression kinds of approaches to systems. Right? They take a system as if it's frozen in time. They almost ignore the dynamic aspects of a system. And that's a big weakness in all of these kinds of systems. Okay? So let's, and you can see here, of course, that this system is comprised of several feedback loops, like we've discussed earlier. And in this example, what we're showing is all of these are balancing loops. So that is why the loops are named as B1, B2, B3, B4, B5, etc. They're all balancing loops within our system. Okay. We, in the next slide, we'll take a look at some reinforcing loops as well. Okay. So here, product attractiveness, of course, affects demand for our product. So the more attractive our product is, greater is the demand for the product. Right? More people want our product, the more attractive it is. The more attractive the iPhone is, more of them, more people want to buy the iPhone. Greater attractiveness, greater demand. And of course, greater the demand, the greater your production pressure. Right? Because always, when you set up a plant to produce something, you set it up with a certain plant capacity. And the more you have to produce, the greater is your production pressure. If you have to produce a low amount of units with all the low number of units with all the resources you have, it may not be very challenging. But with the same resources, if you're asked to double your output, then it becomes challenging. Right? So production pressure increases with the greater demand. And of course, with greater production pressure, you're stressing your production system more. In other words, you might be running your machines longer. You might be working several shifts. You might be, uh, you know, people may have to work faster. All of those things. You know, you have the challenge of uh, getting the raw materials. So you have to, if you want to buy a small quantity, you might be able to get good quality. But if you're buying large quantities of your raw materials, you may not be able to source them all from the same dependable supplier that you've used. You may have to now find other suppliers. So there's all kinds of pressures on quality that come as a result of your increased demand. Right? So the greater the production pressure, the lower the quality. Lower the production pressure, higher the quality. Right? So that's why you see the minus sign there. So that's a negative impact here between these three. So here you've got a loop. Quality affects attractiveness, which affects demand, which affects production pressure, which in turn affects quality. So think in terms of this. Increase the quality, greater attractiveness, greater demand, greater pressure, lower quality. Okay. So an increase in quality, when you flow it through this loop, when you trace it through the loop, leads to a redu reduction in quality. That's why this is a negative feedback loop. Another way to look at it is if you trace through the feedback loop, uh, count the negative signs, you've got one negative sign. That's an odd number of negative signs. And therefore, it's a balancing loop. Okay. Now, incidentally, when you trace through a loop, of course, the arrow directions are significant. You have a loop only if if you trace it in the proper direction of the arrows, then you get a loop, right? Otherwise, it's not really a causal loop. If the arrows don't circle back, 
to uh, the starting point, then that's really not a loop. Okay. So now the greater your production pressure, the lower your ability to launch new products or to increase the functionality of your products. When we say new products, you may think in terms of not completely new, but improvements to the existing products, right? So of course, the more of the effort you have to put in to produce, the less effort you'll be able to produce, uh, less effort you'll be able to put in to make modifications to the product. And therefore, that will reduce the functionality of the product and therefore your attractiveness goes down. Okay, so that is why uh, this is a negative impact. The more production pressure, less your ability. And less your ability, less the functionality, less the functionality, less the attractiveness. Okay. So again, you can uh, trace through the uh, the links and examine the the signs on each of these and make sure you understand those signs. Right. So again, you trace through this loop. It's a balancing loop because it has one minus sign. Okay, that's another balancing loop. And then let's look at this other loop. Uh, the greater the demand, the greater the production pressure. The greater the production pressure, uh, the more you're tempted to increase your price, right? Because after all, you've got a lot of demand and uh, your production process is being stressed. So maybe uh, you're having cost impacts and so on and so forth. So you say, okay, I can increase my price. And of course, if you increase your price, your attractiveness goes down. Another balancing loop. Also, the greater the production pressure, the greater, the greater your delivery delay. And therefore, attractiveness goes down. Okay, so there are all kinds of balancing loops that tend to operate here. And therefore, we realize that the link from price to attractiveness, quality to attractiveness, delivery delay to attractiveness, and functionality to attractiveness is not a one directional link. Because if you look at it over time, then Product attractiveness also influences all of those variables. And of course, typically companies, when they have sustained increase in demand, they don't just keep trying to uh, face the production pressure with just the one factory they have. They tend to increase their production capacity, right? But of course, it's not possible to increase your production capacity dramatically immediately. You need to build a new plant that takes time or you need to create probably other sources of supply for the product, reliable sources of supply. Well, that also has a delay. So that's where you've got a delay. But eventually when your production capacity increases, you can reduce your production pressure. You now have a plant uh, that can produce more products and you finally balance it. That's yet another balance, balancing loop here. As the production pressure increases, you increase your production capacity and that reduces the production pressure. Okay, So this is a very illustrative way to look at this whole system. So here, rather than taking a, a short or very uh, short-term view of the influence of these various variables on product attractiveness, if you take a long-term view, if you take a global picture, then you understand a lot more about all of these impacts than just, you know, what is a mathematical function that connects all of these to product attractiveness. Let us now take a look in the same situation. Let's take a look at some reinforcing groups as opposed to just looking at the balancing groups, right? So we already saw how product attractiveness can negatively impact quality. Now we want to look at how product attractiveness can also positively impact quality, right? So as we said earlier, a system is nothing but a collection of positive and negative feedback loops. How the system behaves depends on the relative strength of each of those loops, right? So when you're trying to manage a complex system, Obviously, it becomes very important for you to understand all the feedback loops and manage the important feedback loops, the dominant loops that determine the outcome to a large extent. Okay, That becomes the, uh, the approach that a good manager will take to a situation. Okay, So here we are looking at all of these variables increasing, uh, affecting product attractiveness. So the greater the product attractiveness, greater is the demand 
earlier we saw that greater is the demand, greater is the production pressure, but you might have heard of the term economies of scale, right? That is, the more you do things at larger volumes, the lot you, you can gain lots of advantages, right? That is because you can spread your fixed costs over many, many more units, okay? So you may have a large plant for which you spend a lot of money, but the larger plant may be capable of making disproportionately larger quantities of the end product. Okay, so you uh, have economies of scale, right? So when you 100 units, you get a certain price, but when you buy 10,000 units, the supplier will be able to give you a much, much lower price, unit price, right? And also, there's a lot of benefits that companies get by learning by doing, which is the more you produce, the more efficient you become at producing because you understand deeper and deeper the production process you can optimize the process and that is called learning by doing or sometimes referred to as the experience curve, right? The more often you do something, the better and better you become at doing it because you understand it more and more deeply. This is obvious, okay? So because of all, because you've, you've got scale economies and because you've learned how to do something better, your quality may improve. You may be able to reduce your price because you now have scale economies and therefore your cost to produce a unit is not as much and therefore you can reduce your price, right? And of course, the more you learn, the more you can uh, fine tune your supply chain and therefore have a lower delivery delay, right? And the more you do, the better you become at things, the more easily you'll be able to increase the functionality, the more attractive your product becomes. All of these are reinforcing loops because you're seeing that there's uh, zero negative signs in each of these loops. Again, you have to trace the loops in the direction of the arrows. So product attractiveness, demand, scale economies, quality, product attractiveness. All the arrows in, are pointing in the right direction or product attractiveness, demand, scale economies, price, product attractiveness. Once again, we are following the arrows in the direction. Okay. And you can look at each of the links and convince yourself that all of these uh, the uh, signs on the loops uh, on the links uh, are meaningful okay so by the way the signs on the links are called link polarity right what is the link polarity and the overall direction of the loop the type of loop that is called loop polarity and all of these are reinforcing loops so we've called them r1 r2 r3 and r4 so loop polarity is reinforcing link polarity here is plus or minus.